I want everyone to sit down and listen to this, even if you think it might be, it might be beyond what you're normally interested in, you should know this. I have an appalling statistic for you. The U.S. has about 5% of the world's population, 5%, but has nearly a quarter of its prisoners. And even on the outside, ex-felons aren't really free. In many states, they can't vote or exercise other rights that most of us take for granted, even at, after they pay their debt to society, so to speak. And our next guest, guest calls this part of the new Jim Crow, the new Jim Crow law, that have uh, left millions of people, especially minorities, out of the electoral process. Michelle Alexander is a professor at The Ohio State University and the author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And she joins us now from Ohio. And Michelle, I don't know if you can see her. This is my book. It's dog-eared. And I think this book is, must, is a must-read. Should colleges should read this. Everyone should be required to read this book. So thank you for coming on, and thank you for writing this book. You talk about... Well, thank you. Yeah, you talk about how many minorities find themselves in the same position as their grandparents, uh, deprived of their civil rights. Who do you blame for the situation, or what do you blame? Well, it has been a bipartisan adventure. Um, the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement is responsible um, for millions of people being swept into our nation's prisons and jails. People are swept in, typically at young ages, often before they're old enough to vote, swept in for relatively you know, minor crimes typically, um, nonviolent, drug-related offenses, swept in, then branded criminals and felons, and then released into a parallel social universe in which many of the basic civil and human rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement no longer apply to and, them, and like Michelle, the right to vote. People will say, okay, so then what are we supposed to, are we not supposed to fight a war on drugs? Are we not supposed to put people in jail or prosecute them? for drug violations? Well, drugs were illegal before the war on drugs was declared. Um, we declared a literal war on poor communities of color, and we did so at a time when drug crime was actually on the decline, not on the rise. President Ronald Reagan declared his drug war in 1982 at a time when drug crime was actually on the decline not on the rise. The war on drugs from the outset had much more to do with politics, including racial politics, than any, any genuine concern about drug addiction or drug abuse. Mm -hmm. um, this drug war has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, even though studies have consistently shown now for decades that contrary to popular belief, people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites, and Michelle, um, but in I, some I, states, I, I just I would just want to get this in. I, I get your point. You think that that is a sort of a misconception in society, uh, and, and actually it's higher among whites than it is among minorities. You, um, you according to statistics in your book. But let's talk about. Let's focus on this now. The election. So much has been talked about voter suppression, voter rights. So the the people who are convicted felons who come out. Um, for sometimes very serious crimes. Or critics would say these aren't victims. Why should they be allowed to vote after they have so-called paid their debt to society? <laughs> well, voting is a right of citizenship. Um, it shouldn't be deemed you know, forfeited because you once made a mistake years ago or decades ago. Um, there are states in the United States today where you're, you forfeit your right permanently um, because um, of a felony you once convicted, were convicted of in your life. Um, voting should be deemed a, a, a right, um, an absolute inalienable right. Uh, mm. In other Western democracies, the idea that you, know, you can uh, be deprived of your right to vote because you once committed a crime is you know, considered laughable. There are actually voting mm -hmm. drives conducted in prisons in other Western democracies. Um, mm. But here in the United States, you can be deprived of your right to vote for a period of years or even the rest of your life. I should say that the, uh, the NAACP launched a campaign this month to restore voting rights uh, to ex-felons, and it's going to be interesting to watch that one. But I want to I be more specific about this election. Um, you have seen the efforts to uh, what some people call voter suppression. Uh, some people say it's to protect the voting process. Uh, by asking people to sh show I identification. Is that voter suppression or is it protecting the voter process? 
Oh, it's absolutely voter suppression, no doubt about it. Um, one of the reasons these cases have been thrown out in courts across the country, I mean, these laws have been thrown out in courts across the country uh, is because they haven't been able to come up with a shred of evidence um, that the voting process has been abused um, by the, uh, the, the lack of ID on the part of individuals. And so really, you know, these voter ID laws, um, much like felon disenfranchisement laws, are an attempt to exclude from the political process poor people, uh, impoverished people, and people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and we have seen these tactics over and over again. They were part of the Jim Crow um, poll taxes and literacy tests um, style disenfranchisement tactics, and uh, we see them resurrected today and uh, in new, uh, new form. Michelle, we're, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for coming on, and we will have you back again. The book is called The New Jim Crow, and I s would suggest that everyone, everyone read this book. It really it was um, very helpful to me, and you taught me a lot. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. All right.